Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Welcome to CS206 uh, Evolutionary Robotics. I'm Josh Bongard, the instructor uh, for this course. I've taught this course many times before, and usually we start this course at the beginning, but due to special circumstances today, we're going to start the course at the end with our living robots. So um, yesterday afternoon, together with some uh, biology colleagues at Tufts, we published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy, uh, which has seemed to attract some media attention uh, yesterday through most of last night and into this morning. So we're going to finish class 10 minutes early today. We have a live interview with BBC. I apologize um, for that. We should get back to our normal schedule uh, on Thursday. And of course, because everything has to happen at once, I obviously am also losing my voice. I'm just getting over a cold. So <laughs> bear with me. So as I mentioned, we're going to start at the end, talking just for a few minutes about uh, living robots as it relates to evolutionary robotics. We'll come back to uh, these living robots at the end of the course, so I don't have time to go into all the details this morning. We're going to spend most of this morning talking about the nuts and bolts of the course, what uh, myself and the TA will expect from you, what you can expect from myself and the TA, uh, and so forth. So a little dry this morning, but we'll get through some logistics, and then we'll get on to the fun stuff uh, in earnest on Thursday. Sound good? Okay, so uh, living robots. Um, in my lab, we have been working in this field of evolutionary robotics for a long time. Uh, we'll spend, obviously, quite a bit of time talking about what exactly that means, but I think even the term itself is somewhat uh, intuitive. In evolutionary robotics, we use uh, a computer program known as an evolutionary algorithm. An evolutionary algorithm tries to uh, evolve a population of candidate solutions to a given problem. When we apply evolutionary algorithms to robotics, the candidate solutions are robots, and the problems are some useful task that we'd like the robot to perform. Most of this work is carried out in simulation. You will get a lot of experience with that uh, in this course. There won't be any hardware uh, in this course. However, uh, in my lab, a lot of the times we take the evolved robots from simulation and then build them out of metals and ceramics and plastics and electronics and sensors and motors, the normal building blocks uh, of robots. But in teaming up with our colleagues at Tufts, instead of turning our simulated evolved bots into robots, we turn them, in this case, into biobots. So what you're seeing in the image here is uh, one of the very, fir very first biobots we built. Um, you'll notice that on the right, it's made up of a series of biological cells. These are uh, frog cells. The red cells are heart muscle cells, or my uh, myocardiocytes, uh, cardiomyocytes, that pulse sometimes together, sometimes not. And the green cells that you see are frog skin cells. So what you're really looking at is a frog. It just doesn't look very much like a frog. What you're seeing on the left is the evolved solution that our evolutionary algorithm came up with. We gave the evolutionary algorithm the task of putting together red voxels and green voxels, or 3D pixels, where the red voxels in simulation uh, increase and decrease their volume. They pulse in and out like frog heart muscle cells, and the green voxels are simply passive soft voxels. They are pushed and pulled by the red cells. The task for the evolutionary algorithm is to try and put these two pieces together in the right shape and the right distribution to get something that just simply moves along the bottom of a petri dish as fast as possible. Pretty simple. Turns out that this particular design, when we built it in reality, it actually does walk along the bottom uh, of the Petri dish. So uh, this morning and into the afternoon, I think if you just Google living robots, you'll find uh, lots of media interpretations uh, of this, this work. So let me just show you a, a short video of this process that I just described. As I mentioned, we make available to our evolutionary algorithm two types of voxels, and the goal is to move. 
We've got our contractile heart muscle cells beating, uh, pulsing in and out, and our passive skin cells. And when the evolutionary algorithm starts up, as you'll see in a moment, it starts with random configurations, not surprisingly, none of which go anywhere. However, a few move maybe a few <laughs> millimeters in simulation. Those survive, produce randomly modified copies of themselves. The slower moving robots are deleted. And if we repeat this process, if we repeat this process, in this case, we obtained this particular robot here. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. So that's part one. As I mentioned, once we have this design in hand, our colleagues at Tufts, one of them is a microsurgeon, so he went in with very, very small scalpels and a very, very small cauterization element, which is basically like a cigarette lighter or a burner that burns away tissue, and was able to sculpt about 20,000 cells taken from a, a frog embryo and rearrange them and sculpt them into the design discovered by the evolutionary algorithm. Our xenobot here, our biobot, doesn't move very quickly, but it does move in the way that the evolutionary algorithm predicted that it would. <clears throat> to make sure that we were actually getting what the computer predicted, we took one of these designs and flipped it on its back and it doesn't move at all. Just sort of a simple test to verify that what the computer discovers is actually occurring in reality. Okay, why build uh, robots out of cells rather than metals and plastics and ceramics and electronics? Medicinal purposes. Medicinal purposes, so one of the applications for this might in future be clinical applications, and again, we'll talk about that towards the end uh, of the course. Another advantage of building robots out of cells is they come with useful functionality preloaded. In this case, we're damaging one of these biobots by cutting it open, and it seals itself back up again. If you cut your laptop nine-tenths of the way in half, it is not going to stitch itself back up again. I don't recommend that. In a second experiment, we, we created multiple instances of this one design that I just showed you, and we put these multiple instances together in a swarm in a Petri dish. And it turns out that although they were evolved just for locomotion, just sort of by chance, they actually end up cleaning up some of these small pellets that we placed uh, in the Petri dish, which we see in simulation and also uh, in reality. <clears throat> In another experiment, we evolved them to push uh, particulate matter, and you can see the physical biobot doing something like that in the bottom. We mentioned clinical applications. One of the potential clinical applications is intelligent drug delivery. This is a, an open problem in micro-robotics. So in this case, we evolved this robot to carry this small yellow pe pellet uh, of medicine. And we haven't yet been able to realize that in a, in a physical biobot, but we're, we're working on that. Okay, I think we'll leave that there. We'll come back to this towards the end uh, of the class. This is something that we just published yesterday. And uh, so have a look uh, online if you like. Okay, so as promised, the dry stuff. Let's uh, go through the syllabus first. Can everyone in the back row see the bottom row of text? Does it help if I move it up a little bit? How's that? Can you see the bottom row of text? Yes? OK. All right. So obviously, we're here, uh, E430, Innovation Hall, uh, Tuesday and Thursday morning. I apologize for the early morning. I'm a morning person. You may not be a morning person, but uh, I promise to both entertain and try to, to educate you. So please be here at 8.30 Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, my office hours are in my office, which is behind that wall. Um, so if you 
Come out the classroom here, make a left and a left and a left. You'll find my office Mondays 3 to 4 p.m., Tuesday, uh, Thursdays 10 to 11 a.m. If due to your course schedule, you can make neither of my office hours, um, just shoot me an email. I can usually arrange to meet up with you at some point uh, outside of office hours. Uh, Atusa Parsa is the teaching assistant uh, for this course. Her office uh, is just behind the classroom that's behind this classroom. So uh, she's going to be holding her office hours in the sitting area outside of Innovation E434. So if you go out this door, make a right, go past the next classroom and make a right. That's the sitting area. She'll be there Mondays 11 to noon and Wednesdays 2 to 3. Uh, if you have technical questions, do try and see Atusa first. If Atusa can't help you, come and see me and I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, so uh, as promised in the course description, um, we're, going to we're going to explore the automated design of autonomous machines. So autonomy appears twice in evolutionary robotics. We're going to be creating robots that are not remote controlled. They are autonomously going to make their own decisions based on their sensory input. And we are also not going to manually design these autonomous machines. We're going to use an evolutionary algorithm and program that evolutionary algorithm to autonomously generate or evolve these autonomous machines for us. So the field of robotics is vast. Evolutionary robotics is one small discipline inside the overall landscape of robotics. And the main distinction of evolutionary robotics compared to most other branches of robotics is this outer loop of automation. There's a lot of amazing work in robotics. You've probably seen Big Dog from Boston Dynamics, drones and so forth. There are some very sophisticated robots out there. But the mechanical design of those robots was created through the intu intuition of a human engineer. Usually the neural network controller of that robot is autonomously trained, but there is a human designer in this outer loop. The goal, overall goal of evolutionary robotics is as the robotics designer to be as hands off as possible. We want to be able to tell the evolutionary algorithm what we want the robot to do, but not how the robot should do it. That's what the evolutionary algorithm is for. Make sense? OK. Uh, the course will cover relevant topics in evolutionary computation. So I'll use the term evolutionary computation and evolutionary algorithms uh, interchangeably. We'll talk a little bit about artificial neural networks. You're going to be using, you're going to be creating neural networks and using them to control your robots. Obviously, this is not a course in neural networks. There is a course here at UVM on neural networks. So we're going to just briefly describe neural networks just enough, enough for us to be able to implement them in, uh, in our robots. Similarly, there is also a course in evolutionary computation. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this class talking about evolutionary algorithms themselves just enough for you to be able to create a, a relatively simple evolutionary algorithm to evolve your robots for you. We will spend a fair bit of time talking about robotics. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about biomechanics, which is the study of animal movement. One of the things that uh, distinguishes autonomous robots from industrial robots, for example, is an autonomous robot needs to be able to get itself from point A to point B. So self-movement is a very important part of uh, autonomous robotics. It is very difficult. One of the reasons why drones are so popular at the moment, but legged machines are still relatively rare, is moving over flat ground with legs is a very complex thing to do. There is a fundamental connection between cognition and intelligence and movement. And we'll explore that uh, to some degree in this course. We'll also spend a fair bit of time talking about physical simulation. As you saw in the BioBot videos, you are also going to be evolving your robots in a physical simulator. So we'll talk a, a fair bit about what physical simulators are and how they can be used for evolving uh, robots. The bulk of this course is going to be uh, Python programming. So as I mentioned in the introductory email, if you're not comfortable with Python or you're a little bit rusty, I would suggest you get on an online Python programming course and brush up your Python skills before 
uh, the semester really gets going. Uh, make sure your Python skills are up to snuff. We're going to actually, I'm going to assign the first programming project uh, today so you can at least get started and get a feel for the amount of programming that's involved in this course. So you have this sort of first week to dive in and feel out for yourself whether this course is, is right for you. Okay. Uh, you're going to be doing 10 cumulative programming projects. For those of you that have taken my human computer interaction course, it runs very similarly. Note the cumulative aspect here. So you'll be submitting, uh, you'll be uh, submitting your programming project each week. And because it's cumulative, if you don't submit the project from the current week, next week you have to finish the one from the previous week as well as finish the one from the next week. So like any math class, be careful not to fall behind. Um, also, the programming projects, as you can imagine, get more intensive as we move on. So be sure to start early. Every programming project is due at 11.59 PM on Monday, every week. So be sure not to leave it till Monday. OK. <clears throat> Um, undergraduates, you're going to be using your developed uh, system to perform a pre-specified experiment in the last four weeks. So the first 10 weeks will be programming projects. The final four weeks will be a, a project, and I'll give you a list that you can choose from. Graduate students, you're going to be doing two programming projects per week, which means you'll be finished after five weeks, which will give you a remaining nine weeks to do a much more substantive research project using your 10 programming projects as your base. Any questions about that? OK. All right, um, this is a device-free zone with the exception of myself. Um, there's a couple of research articles that show that students tend to learn more in a device-free class. I know it may not be the most comfortable thing to do. Trust me, uh, I think this is the way to go. OK, so uh, although you don't have your devices, there are lecture notes for the course. There's two ways to follow along with the lecture notes. You can print them out before class, bring them to class, and annotate them the old-fashioned way. Alternatively, I, t I videotape every lecture. And after class, I will put the lecture up on YouTube and make it available to you. So you can go back and watch the class on YouTube after the fact and annotate the lecture slides uh, electronically if that's more comfortable to you. Watching the lecture or coming and listening to the lecture and annotating along with the lecture is, is the best way to absorb uh, a lot of material. Uh, it's up to you which, which option you choose. OK, uh, there is a textbook for this class. It is optional. You don't need to buy it. Um, we, uh, we haven't put it on loan in the library, but we will put it on hold in the library. You can go pick it up and photocopy various uh, parts from it. I will also put up photocopied parts of it uh, online uh, in the schedule. There is a supplementary textbook. This was a, a textbook that I co-authored uh, with one of my colleagues several years ago now. Um, it is also optional. You don't need to buy it. Thanks to the wonders of modern publishing, uh, each book costs $40. For every book that's sold, I make a grand total of $1. There are 59 students signed up for this class. So if I force all of you to buy a copy of, of the book, uh, I'll be richer by $59. So not much of a financial incentive for me there. Of course, if you want to buy the book, we'd be, we'd be honored. Um, there will also be, as, uh, as we move forward further into the class, there'll be additional readings. I will post those as PDFs to the schedule as we go. OK, um, you've probably seen this already. Prerequisites for this course are junior standing and Python programming experience. If you're missing one or both of these, please come see me uh, as soon as possible, and we'll discuss whether this course is right uh, for you. OK, uh, late policy for this class, any material handed in one day late, 25% deduction, two days late, 50% deduction. If you're handing something in more than two days late, handing it in is optional. As I mentioned, you'll be doing these 10 cumulative programming projects. Each one is worth 4% of your final grade, so clearly they're a, a big part of your final grade. Uh, I think I mentioned most of this here. Um, Yes, 
graduate students, two assignments per week, will be finished in five weeks. At the end of every day on which there is a lecture, which is Tuesdays and Thursdays, you have a quiz due. So tonight, you have a quiz uh, that, that uh, you can complete on Blackboard. It's due by 11.59 p.m. tonight. So when we finish up class here, and after the BBC interview this morning, I will post the quiz to Blackboard. So you should be able to find it there on Blackboard around noon. You can do it any time between noon and 11.59 p.m. If you've come to class and you've uh, done the reading, the quiz should take you no more than two minutes. Um, it's open book. Um, they're very small. Each one is, is worth one or perhaps less than 1%, but they're just there as a gentle prod to keep, you, uh, uh, to keep you on top of the lecture material and the reading material. Okay. As I mentioned, when you finish your 10 programming projects, you will have a functioning simulator in which you can evolve robots, and you'll then be spending the last four weeks or the last nine weeks changing that code base to either change the robot, change the evolutionary algorithm, change the robot's simulated environment, change what you're evolving the robot to do, changing the robot's internal neural network controller, or some sub subset of all those five uh, components. You've got, uh, as I mentioned, for the undergraduates, I'll give, give you a list of reasonable projects. You can still choose your own if you want. Come talk to me about what's sort of reasonable and doable within four weeks. You got a lot of room there for creativity and, and to try things out on your own. Okay. Um, at the end of the course, there is no final exam in this course. Everyone will be presenting their final project orally. As I mentioned, there's 59 of you. We have about three hours during our final exam period, which will give you a grand total of about three minutes, maybe less, to present your final project orally. Uh, we'll talk about how that all works when we get towards the end of the semester. Okay, um, as I mentioned, I found that students tend to learn more when they come to class. So there is a 5% participation grade. At the beginning uh, of every class, I will hand around uh, a participation sheet. Just uh, print your name on the sheet so we can read your name, pass it along to the next person, and I'll collect the uh, attendance sheet at the end of class. If you come to class late, no problem. Just come up to the front at the end of class and make sure that you sign today's attendance sheet. Okay, that's the syllabus. Any questions about the syllabus? All straightforward? Okay, so um, in addition to the syllabus, you'll find on Blackboard a link to the schedule. And I'll put this up at the beginning of every class. Uh, here we are today, Tuesday, January 14. So there's a link to today's uh, lecture notes. I will put up a link to the video lecture on YouTube about at about noon today. There's a link to the reading for today. There is no optional reading for today. And undergraduates, you are being assigned the first of the 10 programming assignments today. Graduate students, you are being assigned the first two programming assignments today. As you can see, next Monday at 11.59 p.m., undergraduates, assignment one is due and graduate students assignments one and two are due. Again, when I get back to uh, my office later today, I will put up the link for Thursday's lecture notes and Thursday's reading. So um, the day before class or the night before class, have a look at the schedule and you should be able to draw down the lecture notes and the reading for the following day. That's the schedule, all good? Okay, so uh, let's just have a, a quick look at uh, Blackboard. So if you click on course materials, <coughs> if you click on course materials, there we go. Uh, there's the, a link to the syllabus and the schedule that I just showed you. All of the quizzes will be available in this folder and all of the assignments are available in here. Here's assignment one and two already posted for uh, the graduate students. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's logistics. We'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, I can't resist talking a little bit about robots. So 
why take a course uh, on, on robotics? Why take a course on evolutionary robotics? We'll spend a few minutes now just talking about the why of robots. And we'll spend the rest of the semester talking about the how of robots, how to build them, how to deploy them, how to simulate them, how to manufacture them, uh, and so on. So uh, whenever I talk about uh, robots, of course, the reason to take a course in robots is that they're the coolest thing ever. But other than that, they, some of them have practical utility. Uh, tell me about the difference between the top pair of images and the bottom pair of images. What is the point I'm trying to make with these four photographs? They can replace humans. They can replace humans. So in the top pair, uh, this is a picture of one of the very first factories. So Henry Ford, over 100 years ago, came up with this idea of mass production. So instead of having a single artisan who creates the entirety of one object, Better to have a group of specialists where each specialist adds one component to the object being built. That was sort of the way to systematize the way to build things. And the idea of mass production uh, allowed us to build many more things much more quickly and much more cost effectively. Mass produ production many, many decades later, starting in the 1970s, led to automation. So for better, for worse, starting in the 1970s, the human specialists started to be replaced with robot specialists, which did basically the same thing. They added one component to the object being constructed. We'll spend some time towards the end of the course talking about the ethics of robots. One of the worrying aspects of robotics, robots for a lot of people is that it's going to put them out of a job. We'll talk about that later. OK, so yes, robots can replace people. But there's an additional point that I'm trying to make with these four photographs. What is it? I'm sorry? Will it create more job opportunity? Possibly. So if you look at the computer industry, Computers put a lot of people out of work, but created many more jobs than it, uh, than it obviated. Whether the same thing will happen with robotics, nobody knows. And again, we'll discuss that later in the course. So robots can replace people. But in the bottom pair of images, robots have not replaced people. Why not? sort of repetitive tasks that don't really require decision making on the bottom. You need to make decisions like where do I walk, where do I put things, how do I adapt to disturbances. Ex like, that, like that car robot will only do the same thing over and over again. Just on the other side, it's good to do the same thing. Exactly, exactly. So the top pair of images shows how robotics or mass production and then <laughs> industrial robotics completely change the way that we build things indoors, but they have not done the same, robots have not done the same thing with the way that we build things out of doors for the reason that your colleague here just mentioned. There is something different about outdoor environments compared to indoor environments, which so far have defeated the best efforts of most roboticists. Imagine we're working at a construction site and we'd like to deploy robots to do nothing more than move uh, bricks from pile A to pile B. If we're autonomously evolving robots to autonomously decide how to move piles, how to move bricks from pile A to pile B, perhaps the evolutionary algorithm comes up with a simple example that the robot picks up a brick at A and throws the brick at pile B. What could possibly go wrong, right? Yes? Not every brick is in the same place. Not every brick is in the same place. So the robots are going to have to sort of figure out where the bricks are. If we were to deploy these brick-throwing robots at different construction sites, what could possibly go wrong? The path from A to B is not always clear. The path from A to B is not always clear, possibly. Maybe there's an object in between. What's that? 
possible of it possibility of injury right osha. sorry osha. what's osha the safety practice. oh safety practice there yeah exactly osha's gone out the window for sure in this case right okay so we'll change things uh, the robots only do this on the construction site at night when there are no workers on the site. OSHA's happy. What could possibly go wrong? Nothing, right? Yes? There could still be other obstacles that you might not want to get yourself into the break. Possibly. <laughs> Maybe, the yes? You could, was, Go ahead. You could break the brick. Throw it. Could break the brick, possibly? Yep. Weather could be an issue, too, depending on the, the robot. Weather could be an issue. So maybe we decide this throwing bricks option is not a good one. We tell the evolutionary algorithm, come up with any strategy to move bricks from pile A to pile B without throwing them. The robots pick up brick A, drive to B, and drop it. Come back, pick up another one. Sounds much safer, doesn't it? What could possibly go wrong now? Maybe not. Maybe it's not the most efficient thing, but we're not we're not uh, being charged hourly labor now, so it's relatively cheap. So let's not worry about efficiency for now. Variable terrain or lack thereof in the lower left hand corner. Yes, variable terrain. So do we have robots that are climbing girders? <laughs> Maybe there's a road between pile A and pile B, and the robot is happily carrying a brick from A to B. What could possibly go wrong? There's an infinite number of details that make it difficult to come up with one good, simple solution for an autonomous machine to just move bricks from pile A to pile B. Over 2,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, man never enters the same river twice. Humans and organisms in general have 4.5 billion years of experience of dealing with environmental variation. We're not perfect, but we are much better than machines. So as you'll see, as we move through this course, some of the major challenges in autonomous robotics are not technical challenges. We know how to build smartphones. We built the internet. We've built the International Space Station. We're pretty good at building very, very complex machines. We are not very good at building machines that are both adaptive and autonomous. It is a completely open problem, despite what Boston Dynamics videos might lead you to, to think. No one yet has a good answer to that problem. Maybe some of you will be able to contribute a solution to this open problem. So um, why study robotics? There are clearly economic advantages if we can ever crack this nut. Indoor automation has saved, uh, has created very rich economies. You can imagine the same thing if we could automate the construction and maintenance of large scale infrastructure out of doors. Right? You might have heard statistics like we could easily build enough solar and wind farms to completely wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. We just don't do it because the economics don't make sense. Paying labor to build and maintain a solar farm large enough to power the continental United States just doesn't, doesn't yet make economic sense. If we could automate aspects of that process, maybe it would, which suggests why robots outside may be particularly useful. Again, who knows what the killer app would be if we can create adaptive and autonomous machines that can operate safely out of doors in proximity to humans. But personally, I think one of the killer apps might be in the energy sector. If you look at all the alternative energy proposals that are already deployed or that are in development, they're all farms, solar farms, wind farms, wave farms. They're collections of a lot of devices. Some of them are, are working in pretty extreme environments where they need constant maintenance. Perhaps outdoor robots could help with this task. Again, who knows, but interesting to think about. So again, very practical reasons why you might want to study and create autonomous and adaptive reason, uh, robots. But there are also interesting intellectual reasons to try and create autonomous machines. 
As I mentioned, this is basically an open frontier, both in science and technology. We don't understand adaptive behavior well enough to be able to put it into machines. So there is yet no real guiding theory about intelligence. If you look at a lot of the other branches of the natural sciences, there are sort of basic roadmaps. The, the natural sciences are not solved in any way, but there are sort of fundamental principles that guide the study of biology and chemistry and physics uh, and so on. Obviously, biology has Darwinian evolution. Physics has the twin pillars of Newtonian and quantum mechanics. What is the guiding foundation for chemistry? It's probably one of the first things you were taught in your chemistry class in high school. Table of elements. The table of elements, right? The elements in the universe are not randomly organized. They have, it turns out they have some basic structure and relationship to one another, which is neatly summarized by the periodic table of elements. There is no equivalent guiding principle yet for natural or artificial intelligence. For a lot of people working in AI and robotics, that's what we're after, right? A guiding principle. Okay, so uh, it's open, it's a wild west. There's a lot of work to be done there. Hopefully some of you will contribute uh, ideas there. It is also very interdisciplinary. So uh, throughout this course, you'll find that it is very broad, but not necessarily so deep. We're not gonna go into any one topic in great depth. We're gonna touch on a lot of different subjects. Obviously, we're gonna be building an evolutionary algorithm, which is an abstraction of evolutionary biology. We're gonna be building neural networks, which are abstractions of nervous tissue. We're gonna talk about cognitive science, the study of the mind, psychology, biomechanics, I already mentioned, the study of motion. Uh, physics, we're gonna be working with a physics engine, so unfortunately, we're gonna have to do a little bit uh, of physics. And obviously a lot of computer science, there's gonna be a lot of coding in this course. We, we will talk about mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, bioengineering, uh, even chemistry. So some of the soft robots that we're gonna be talking about towards the end of the semester are made out of very exotic materials, which will take us into chemistry. Uh, we'll do a little bit of math along the way. And philosophy. So I've already mentioned one philosopher this morning. It's hard to think of other topics that span this broad a range of disciplines. I hope, like myself, you find this to be of interest as we work our way through evolutionary robotics. Okay, so that's, that's the why. Where is evolutionary robotics going? Well, as I already showed you, biobots. Um, not surprisingly, NASA is also interested in evolutionary robotics. Watch a short video uh, of NASA's evolving robots. Um, although not shown in this video, one member of the NASA team that worked on this is uh, Nick Cheney. Uh, Nick was an undergraduate in this course uh, seven years ago. After completing his undergraduate here at UVM, he went to do a PhD, and during his PhD, he spent part of his time at NASA Ames, which is sort of the basic science uh, side of NASA, and worked on NASA's Tensegrity robot. Today we're going to be looking at what we call our super ball bot, the tensegrity <coughs> robot that we're designing that is able to both land on a planetary surface, absorbing impact, and is also able then to move around and explore the planet. This shows the unpacking from a very compact position you know, to a full robot, which is very important in space travel because um, your payload carrying volume is a premium. premium. So, so if you can pack this tightly, um, you can pack multiple of them or you can make a very cheap mission out of it. In traditional NASA missions, landing is one of the most difficult, expensive, and one of the most unreliable things about a mission. This is kind of a fundamentally simple landing system. If you can survive a hard landing and you keep that system, you can survive almost anything. You can go 
go up little cliffs, you can go down, you know, steep terrain and so forth. So, so it really gives you a very secure, robust system. What you see here in the landing is the central payload, and it's that little sphere in the middle of all the rods. It's protected from impact forces of landing by the elastic absorption of energy in this tensegrity structure. Much like we use our muscles to move our bodies around, we are going to be shortening and lengthening the cables of these structures to create motion by changing the dynamic balance tensions in the system. A benefit <coughs> of these robots is there's a whole lot of control points and a lot of flexibility. So, so that's really great in that they can go up hills, they can handle bumps, they can handle a uneven train, um, but it's also very difficult to control. So, so instead of the traditional control of kind of top down, you know how to control something, but we just tell it what to do. It, instead, our, our primary <coughs> approach has been to evolve the control. The best we can hope for is to give it lots of options of what it may do. So, so we can select hundreds, if not thousands of different options, then some are good and some are bad. If, if at the beginning, most of them are bad, but if you slowly take the good ones, like evolution, you replicate the good ones, make small changes, and eventually the, the good ones get better and better, and you know, out of all the thousands of bad controllers, you actually evolve a few good ones. One of the interesting questions is how does a structure like this move through a field of rubble and rocks and whatever you might encounter on the surface of the, another planet? And so this was an initial first uh, pass at saying what does it look like for a robot to, this type of robot to encounter a bunch of obstacles and move through them. <laughs> One of the advantages of a Tensegrity robot like we're designing is it's a very compliant and forgiving system. And so we're trying to maximize the ability of the system to move through environments reactively. And then it makes your high level navigation and control problem a lot easier. So you can imagine actually putting four or five all in one aerosol and all <laughs> unpacking you know, very nice and neat. And so you could have a mission where you can have four or five, or possibly if you made them small, dozens or even hundreds, all going at the same time. And then that clip, I believe, showed high level algorithms of coordination. So you can imagine many of these, you know, that they're all robust in themselves, and then they can all coordinate with each other and perform science quickly and also reliably. You know, if a few of them don't make it, it's okay. The, the others will coordinate and make up for that. When you're exploring another planet, what drives the mission is the scientific instruments that you want to bring to that planet to explore, to ask basic questions. Okay, uh, you can watch the rest of the video uh, on your own. So uh, in this case, they had a, the general idea for the mission. They'd like to have a collapsible robot that they can, can collapse into a very stowable volume to put uh, in the rocket to get to wherever they're going. Once they get there, it automatically opens and protects the payload upon an uncontrolled landing. That's the basic idea. Yes? They didn't evolve the physical form of it, just the controller? They evolved the physical form as well. That's what makes this evolutionary robotics. The evolutionary algorithm is figuring out how to combine together these rods with connected springs and the neural network controller, which is able to pull on the springs or stop pulling on the springs to allow them to release again. If you go back and watch the video at your leisure, if you watch carefully the motion, you'll see that these, the springs are actually actively decreasing in length. So they're simulating a motor that's pulling on the spring. So again, the NASA engineers have an idea about what the robots are supposed to do, collapse, automatically open, protect uh, the payload on landing, move about the surface, don't be tripped up by obstacles, and so on. What they did not specify is how the robot should do so. This rod should be connected to this rod, and this rod should be connected to this rod, and this motor should compress spring number three when it detects this much pressure from the ground, and so on, right? That's the job of the evolutionary algorithm. Imagine that I gave you a bunch of rods and springs and motors and asked you to construct a tensegrity robot. You're a little bit biased because you've already seen some now. Imagine I gave you the tensegrity robot you just saw and asked you to build a tensegrity arm and on the end of that arm is a little shovel. So the tensegrity should roll a little bit and when it gets to an area of interest, it should start digging. 
What shape should the arm take? How do you put these rods together? And how should the motors pull on those springs to produce a digging motion? It is an extremely non-intuitive thing for even a master engineer to be able to sit down and design by hand. Better to turn over this non-intuitive task to an evolutionary algorithm and let it figure it out. Okay. So um, this is probably the most important slide in the whole course. We're going to look at a very large number of evolutionary ro uh, robotics experiments. We've already seen a few already this morning. They're going to differ from one another in lots of ways, but they're all going to share the same four components. And we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about each of these four components. Obviously, we need a task environment for a robot to move about in. In our case, we're going to be using a physics engine to simulate this task environment. Into this simulated environment, we can place the robot and also additional objects. We need to create the robot itself, obviously, or tell the evolutionary algorithm how to create the robot. The robot needs a way to decide how to act on its environment given what it's currently sensing. It does that using an artificial neural network. And finally, we need to wrap these three components in an evolutionary algorithm, which is going to modify the robot itself and its neural network controller until it finds a robot brain pair that does something use what we want it to do in the task environment. Okay, so here's just a, a much simpler experiment showing these four components. What you're watching is a series of snapshots from an evolutionary algorithm. You're seeing most of the successes, but none of the failures. So I'm only capturing as the evolutionary process proceeds the best robot in the population at that time. In this case, we've simplified the evolutionary algorithm a little bit. It is not allowed to tinker with the body. We gave the body to the evolutionary algorithm. The only thing the evolutionary algorithm is allowed to tinker with is the neural network controller. What did we ask the evolutionary algorithm to train the robot to do? To pick up the pillar. To pick up the pillar and basically the computer is watching to see how close the robot gets the blue object to the, red, uh, to the gray sensor on its back. You can think of that gray sensor as like a distance sensor. It's, it's looking to minimize the distance between the blue object and the gray sensor on its back. Okay, so what you're watching here is actually snapshots during the first part of the evolutionary algorithm. Once the evolutionary algorithm finds a neural network that allows the robot to pull the object onto its back, we change the experiment slightly. So now I'm going to speed things up even more, where now you're looking at cuts from the same evolutionary algorithm, but much further into the future. What is the change we make every time the robot, every, every time the evolutionary algorithm successfully finds a neural network to get the object onto the robot's back. You move the block further back. We, we make a slight change to the task environment. We meaning the investigators. Again, this is not under evolutionary algorithms control. What happens once we make a slight change to the task environment? What's the impact on the evolutionary algorithm? The robot starts to travel towards the object. There is nothing in the evolutionary algorithm that says the robot, or we, did, we didn't tell the evolutionary algorithm, the robot must walk. We just said, get the blue object onto the robot's back. Right? So the, the walking that you see is a side effect of what we were asking for, which is object manipulation. What solution or solutions does the evolutionary algorithm come up with? You mentioned walking. This is kind of walking in a very loose sense of the word. So, so while it's walking, it's, it's kind of constantly feeling to try and find the object, too, like its front. 
Interesting, Interesting right? You'll notice that the, the gripper moves in phase with the legs. We're not quite sure why that happened. It might be because the neural network controllers kind of fused the movement of the legs with the gripper. Who knows? What other observations can you pull out of this, this video? They kind of look like antennas. They kind of look like antennas, right? Yeah, that was ob obviously our design. What else is occurring over this evolutionary algorithm? Is it always moving in the same way? One of the advantages of using an evolutionary algorithm is that it's, it often not just finds one solution to the problem, but finds a diversity of solutions, right? One of the, the hallmarks of mother nature is her creative <laughs> ability, right? There isn't just one solution she finds, but many different ones. So you can see a lot of diversity here. What else is happening? The walking, the, the manner in, in which it is, it is walking is different. Exactly, the manner in which it's walking is different, right? So we're seeing evolution trying out lots of different solutions. It doesn't hit on one way of walking and then change that way of walking slightly whenever we move the blue block further away from the robot. How well is the robot doing at the task? Is it optimal? Pretty far from optimal. You'll notice in some of the, the clips, the robot fumbles the object, right? It kind of grabs it and throws it onto its back, which is probably not what we had in mind. One of the biggest challenges and ultimately potential dangers of evolutionary robotics is what's known as perverse instantiation. Actually, this is a problem in all of robotics and AI, that the robot or, or the evolutionary algorithm solves the problem but not in the way we would have liked it to do so. As I mentioned, we're always trying to tell the evolutionary algorithm what we want, but not how to do it. And often the how that's uh, discovered by evolutionary algorithms is definitely not what we wanted. So there's an inside joke in evolutionary robotics that evolved robots are very much like teenagers. They will do exactly what you told them to do, but in exactly the way you didn't want them to do it. Okay, again, an open problem. Uh, do robots like this that have the, the secondary learning nature, things that you didn't tell it to do, like the walk in this example, yep. do, they, do they learn faster how to walk than robots you just wanted to learn to walk from a point blank stance? Uh, that's a good question. So <coughs> we weren't selecting for walking explicitly here. So if we just asked for walking, do they walk faster? Uh, I don't know, it's a good question. Obviously, speed here is not necessarily of the essence. It just needs to get the object onto its back. Well, as far as the learning optimization yep. goes, because obviously the more optimized it gets, the, more, uh, the faster it can get the block onto its back, so it must have a, a need to figure out that optimization itself, yep. compared to just saying, hey, block. That's a good question, I don't know. That would be a perfectly reasonable final project. What happens if we select for robots that walk or select for robots that must manipulate an object that's far from them. Which of those two cases leads to faster walking and why? That would be a great example of a final project. Okay, so uh, let's dip back into logistics for a moment. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, participation is part of your grade. Here's some data from previous classes. Um, and it may be hard to see in this figure. Well, let me see if I can zoom in on this. Well, I can talk you through this. The vertical, uh, sorry, the horizontal axis is percent grade. The vertical axis is the number of missed class classes. Each point represents a former student of this class. It's not a perfect fit, but pretty much students that tend to come to class more often do better. So please come to class. Okay. Uh, let's just skip ahead here. Let's talk about expectations. Uh, I want to try and get through most of the logistics before 9.35 this morning. So my expectations for you are feedback. As you've already noticed, most of the lectures are pretty interactive. Common sense when it comes to attendance and submission of, of material. Regular but not necessarily perfect attendance. Um, 
If you miss le three or less classes, you still get the 5% participation grade. If you find that you're missing more than three classes, come and let me know why and we can talk about it. Expect hard work. Um, there's a lot of coding in this class. Be sure to get started early every week on the programming projects. Uh, I expect memorization of key concepts. Even though all the quizzes are open book and there's no final exam, why do we expect some memorization of key concepts? Because when you go to a job interview and you tell them you took a class in evolutionary robotics, the interviewer has never heard of evolutionary robotics and asks you to describe it to them. If you can do so in an intelligent manner, that will help you in a job interview. I don't expect you to memorize every detail of every, every evolutionary robotics experiment we talk about. All of the experiments we talk about they're just there as illustrations of basic concepts. So in the, uh, the blue block robot I just showed you, we talked about a few concepts. Evolutionary algorithms tend to produce a diversity of solutions. And evolutionary algorithms sometimes produce perversely instantiated solutions to our problem. Right? That's the stuff I expect you to remember, not the details of how this particular experiment uh, played out. Okay, um, you'll have a lot of opportunity, as I mentioned, for creativity when we get to your final project. I expect self-learning in this class. The TA is not gonna teach you Python. There's lots of online tutorials. Teach yourself the tools that you need to succeed in this course. Expect a positive attitude with me, the TA, and your fellow students. I, I assume that goes without uh, saying. What you cannot expect from me or the TA um, if you come to us and say, look, my code is crashing, we don't know where your bug is any better than you do. Um, and again, we can't help with uh, you learning a programming language, installing software. If you don't know about Stack Overflow, you should. It will be your best friend in this class and every other class you take, every other CS class you take uh, at UVM. Okay, what can you expect from me um, I'm happy to help with why questions. Um, this is left over from when we used to teach this class in C, so I just left it here. In C, you need to manually allocate and deallocate memory. If you've never heard of that concept, uh, be thankful. Doesn't exist, doesn't exist in Python. Um, so again, there may be programming concepts that come, out, come up throughout the, uh, the 10 assignments. If you want to talk about the why, I'm happy to, to talk about that. But again, we expect you've tried to, to Google it before. I'm happy to talk about conceptual issues. If, you're, if you remember that we talked about perverse instantiation, but you don't have a good grasp on the concept, come on by office hours and I'd be happy to, to chat about it. Any clarification about expectations of quizzes and, ex quizzes and assignments, happy to talk about it. You can expect from me, especially in lecture, is an emphasis on concepts, not on tools, because tools come and go. As I mentioned, we used to teach this class in C. I imagine if I'm still teaching this class in five years' time, I may not be teaching it in Python. It may be something completely different. Right? Tools come and go. Concepts, not so much. Right? Heraclitus and the rest of us have been struggling with uh, ad adaptation to external change for over 2,000 years. It's probably not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon. Okay, so I think we'll end today <clears throat> talking about the nuts and bolts of the assignments themselves. This may seem like a little bit of an overly complicated way to do the assignments and submit them. I'm going to walk you through this process. The reason why it seems complicated is because the assignments are actually embedded in a shadow online course that uh, online students take along with you. They watch the video lectures, uh, obviously, once they're posted, and they're doing the assignments along with you on the internet. We'll talk about how this works. For you, you're starting in Blackboard, as I mentioned, and on course materials, you find the assignments. If you click on the instructions, this will bring up um, a link to a Google Doc, there we go. A Google Doc which will describe, or basically it doesn't describe much except pointers into Reddit. So the assignments themselves are posted in the Ludobots subreddit, which is my nickname for this course online. 
So uh, if we follow the link into Reddit, so we follow the link in Google Docs into Reddit, and we're now in the online course. And you'll notice a bunch of links at the top. So you're starting with this assignment here, which is setting up and running the physics simulation. Every assignment is a set of enumerated uh, steps. So if you get stuck on something and you want to go see the TA, make sure when you go and see the TA, tell her that you're stuck on step, uh, step 17 of assignment four. It will help her and you get oriented uh, quickly. So you'll work your way through these steps. And what you'll find at the end of every assignment is a request to either post an image to Imager or a video to YouTube. So in this course, you do not submit code. Atus and I are not very good at reading code and telling, running it in our heads to see whether it works or not. You're submitting images or videos that are designed to demonstrate to us that your code is working. Yeah? Make sense? OK. So uh, in this first assignment, you're just making, uh, you're making an image. You're doing all of the coding in Python. Um, I don't think it matters which version of Python you use. Fingers crossed. Once you're done, you post uh, an image that's produced by your code <clears throat> to, in this case, Imager. You then come back, uh, you come back to Reddit and you post a link to your image in Reddit, in the subreddit. Again, this is all explained in the instructions itself. So I've now clicked at the top level of the subreddit, and you'll notice that some of you have already submitted your solutions to assignment one. So myself or the TA can just click on this link. We can see, uh, we can see your solution and very quickly determine visually whether you've implemented that assignment correctly or not. Sound good? Any questions? Yes? Specify our name on submission? You don't need to in Reddit. The reason why is the final step is you're going to be coming back to Blackboard and submitting in Blackboard a link to Reddit, to your Reddit submission. Make sense? Again, sounds like a very roundabout way to do that. You here taking this course physically are obviously starting in Blackboard and ending in Blackboard. Online students are starting in Reddit and ending in Reddit, <coughs> right? So uh, you'll be following along with your online peers in the inner part of this loop, but obviously your work will be assessed by the TA and myself in Blackboard. Again, all the instructions should be uh, in there. Any questions about that? Yes? You said in an email that we, if we don't have a Linux machine, ah. we we'll have to boot Ubuntu. Yes. So, okay. So you're going to be using uh, a particular physics engine, uh, PyroSim, which is uh, not compatible with Windows. It runs on Mac and Linux, but not Windows. So if you have a Windows machine, there are diff two different options. You can set up a dual boot partition if you know how to do that, or you can Google how to do that. A simpler solution is to run a virtual machine on your Windows box, and that virtual machine runs a virtual instance of Ubuntu. If you have a Windows machine and none of what I just said makes sense, don't panic. It's all described in the assignment itself. If you follow along and you get stuck, go and see the TA, and she will help you with any installation issues you may have. This week for the undergraduates, assignment one is basically installing the physics engine and just running the demo out of the box. And if the demo works, you're taking a picture of the demo, submitting that to Reddit. That's about it. Uh, we have different combinations of Python and Windows and Ubuntu and Max and so on. Some of you, the installation may take two minutes. Some of you may have an unfortunate combination of hardware and software, and installation may take you much longer. So make sure to get started. If you're surprised at how quickly it takes you to assi finish assignment one, be thankful you're done. Uh, you can move on to assignment two if you want, uh, the undergraduates. But again, assignment two will not be due until two weeks from now. 
Okay, I think we will pause there for today unless there are any questions about logistics. Everybody sign the attendance sheet. If you didn't, it's back there somewhere, right there. I will see you at 8.30 on Thursday morning. Thank you.